Hi all, let's have a look at one of Lasker's greatest games and most celebrated. So this is in a record number of collections at Chess Games Con for Lasker. Many argue it's one of the most beautiful games ever played actually, not just one of the most beautiful of Lasker's games. It was against Harry Nelson Pillsbury in the 1896 St. Peter's Berg tournament. Just to give some context, Harry Nelson Pillsbury had won the Hastings 1895 tournament in spectacular fashion. In fact, he hadn't been competing in international tournaments, and that had been his first international tournament, and he won it spectacularly. And at the closing bank banquet of, of the Hastings tournament, uh, Shugorin announced that the top prize winners had been invited to this St. Petersburg uh, tournament in a, for a match tournament to begin in December that year. That's why this is 1895 to, 90, to 96. So it was in December going into the next year. So the top finishers, Pillsbury, Shigorin, Lasker, plus fifth pay, placed um, uh, Steinitz agreed to play. Uh, the fourth placed finisher, Siegbert Tarash, declined. He was really not wanting to, to uh, kind of play Lasker actually for a considerable time for various other reasons. So anyway, this St. Petersburg tournament, enormously strong, and uh, they have to play each other six times each in this tournament. So this is a key encounter from round 10. So let's have a look. Harry Nelson Pillsbury playing with the white pieces plays d4. Lasker plays the very popular d5. C4, we have e6, so a queen's gambit declined position, knight f3, but now an energetic c5. And so this is a variation of the Tarash, in a way, talking about Tarash. We have bishop g5 here. If c takes d5, uh, this is an interesting continuation nowadays. For example, knight takes this position uh, is pretty interesting and has been played in high-level games nowadays. For example, Magnus Carlsen against Zeong, Weekend Z 2020, which ended in a win, uh, no, ended in a draw, that, that game was drawn. So there's high level games from this position uh, as an alternative, just playing uh, C takes D5. Uh, so Black can also play E takes, and Magnus Carlsen has played with the black pieces here, actually. For example, G3, uh, he's played uh, knight c6, and he won a game against Levon Aronian in Moscow 2019. So that was a very interesting game uh, by Magnus Carlsen. So yeah, there's very, very high-level stem games around here. But anyway, we don't have c takes in this game. We have actually bishop g5. And now we have c takes d4, queen takes d4, and our tempo gaining knight c6. Queen h4. Okay, now bishop e7. There is a slight issue already with white's position, actually, that uh, it's it's a little bit inflexible, the queen here. It's like hard-coded for some sort of attack, which might not happen. And also there's a commitment for white here, because these pieces are at home. It's like there's a broader commitment to castle queenside, which when you castle queenside, there's a lot more weaknesses to try and cover, generally. Uh, so it is quite a committal form of attack, you know, this, this, this setting the preconditions here. Uh, it's, it's not all roses for white here. Uh, so Nazca playing extremely classically and white casting now queenside. And it looks kind of logical for d5 pressure. But king safety is a major factor here already, you could argue. We see the move queen a5. And now e3 is played. We have bishop d7, so getting ready for that c file. Uh, h6 was an alternative as well, and say c takes, uh, e takes, bishop takes, bishop takes. White would have to play rook takes, and um, this is just better for black, this position. Yeah, just winning an exchange there, that's better for black. So it is a bit tricky after bishop d7. Black is rapidly getting some c-file counterplay, it seems, potentially. We have king b1. And then it's move h6, which kind of ties the queen to h4. It can't really go to g3 because of hg now. So that pin, you might think it's bad to be in a self-pin, but it backfires 
well it kind of in a way it kind of virtually pins the queen to h4 <laughs> so we have here uh, c takes d5 e takes and now knight d4 yes this is pretty tricky black castles and now there's no sacrifice bishop takes h6 this just doesn't work white played bishop takes f6 if bishop takes h6 for those wondering g takes queen takes black just plays knight e4 and the g5 square is covered here and there's pressure on c3 and for example h4 knight b4 threatening knight takes and queen takes a2 for example like this is devastating or is it's going to be the knight's covering c2 but this is this is just much better for black uh so yeah th these are tricky uh variations so bishop takes was played which gives Lasker the dark square bishop without the counterpart so a huge amount of potential pressure along this diagonal we have queen h5 looking at d5 knight takes which takes away the frontal pressure on that pawn by forcing white to recapture so that's kind of protecting that pawn and now bishop e6 reinforcing d5 now here they're quite an ambitious move f4 you'll note that you know these pieces are still at base so if white white's intention to try and undermine uh the d5 pawn kick this knight uh, kick this bishop back and then play queen f3 is a nice intention but um Lasker chooses the most accurate kind of rook to use now rook ac8 for some counterplay this rook is left here and it's protecting usefully f7 uh, which is a potential soft spot in some lines potentially you can imagine it could be a potential soft spot so this rook is left defensively and this is the attacking rook here uh, we have uh, f5 and now uh, Lasker could play bishop d7 I mean this is actually plausible to allow this continuation with bishop c6 because actually um, after b5 it seems you know black has good counterplay here for example this position with d5 reinforced um, as, as a fictional scenario there's enough c file pressure that area of responsibility squares around the king it's it's kind of um, very nice for black and a battery could be set up here and this could be very dangerous after bishop c4 uh, in conjunction with this dark square bishop this is an extremely dangerous position uh, so for example here this is all favoring black for example this is great for black and here on bishop takes d4 if b takes then there's b3 uh, and uh, if queen takes then there's rook b8 otherwise there's things like queen a1 check it gets really nasty for the white king so it does seem as though it was plausible actually to consider just bishop d7 but Lasker finds something really amazing which I'm sure you can guess actually so I'm just gonna play it he actually plays rook takes c3 uh, so refusing to move the bishop refusing to waste any time here we have f takes e6 uh, if b takes c then actually can you see what black does here if I give you 10 seconds to pause the video what would you play with black okay just rook c8 yeah the queen side responsibility of these squares is it's just too much here if f takes queen takes c3 and yeah there's horrible threats here if queen e2 then bishop takes d4 is devastating it threatens queen a1 with that battery and if rook takes sorry and if e takes f7 king f8 is good not to allow any tricks and if g3 queen a1 check and mate and if rook takes d4 then queen c1 which illustrates you know the dangers of casting queen side so in fact yeah after rook takes c3 uh, this bishop should be taken basically uh, and it is so we have though now another really truly spectacular move here I wonder if you can guess it for 200 points it's especially delightful if you haven't seen this game ever before you're in for a treat here what would you play with black here okay rook a3 yeah it's it's a really remarkable 
rook sacrifice. You'll note here that black has this dark square bishop without a counterpart. This can be very, very handy along with this c file here, potential c file, and the exposure of the white king. Now, there are actually mistakes and blunders from both sides in this game. It doesn't stand up well to technical scrutiny, but it's still one of the most beautiful you know, games. It's considered one of the most beautiful games ever, despite its flaws. And here, Harry Nelson Pillsbury did play a move which is flawed. He played e takes f7. Intuitively, it kind of untangles this rook, which could be used on that c file again with a vengeance. Now, if Harry Nelson Pillsbury was a supercomputer, he could play b takes a3. It's the best move technically, and apparently not be in trouble after check bishop b5, queen takes king a1. Uh, this is looking difficult to play, but uh, it turns out here after rook d2, yeah, this tactical move because it's relying on tactics like queen e6 and queen c8. <laughs> This this is uh, this tactical sequence shows that maybe White could survive it, but you know Lasker's not playing a su supercomputer, so Harry Nelson Pil Pillsbury that that requires quite significant calculations uh, to take this. I mean, let's look at this again. Queen b6 check. If Bishop b5 isn't played, then if King a1, Bishop takes d4 check, and the King is brought out to play or not, you might wonder, what what is going on here? Well, it reveals rook f2 for a killer common square. Uh, for example, queen e2, rook f2, and basically, uh, after rook f6 here, a huge tempo gainer, and also swinging via this b file. This is just a killer. Uh, Black will end up winning, for example, like that. Uh, so yeah, this, this uh, is necessary to play bishop b5, it seems, in light of stuff like that. Uh, so bishop b5, queen takes, we, we looked at king a1 just then, if king c2, then check, and although black's the exchange down, because of the king safety issue, here after queen takes g2, uh, this is really nasty, the, the queen is covering all the king's escape squares, and there's a killer check coming in, uh, potentially there's another killer check here as well, and other stuff going on, so if takes here, for example, check, Rook c2 actually is the most accurate, and then that's desperate from white. But what does white do here? If rook e2, rook takes, queen takes, bishop g5 is uh, chatmate. So it's it's a very, very interesting situation, but it turns out, yeah, e takes f7 from a supercomputer perspective is a mistake. Intuitively, okay, it untangles black a bit, it develops this rook, which can now go to use the c file pretty quickly. Now, taking is played queen b6 so technically black is winning right now bishop b5 is played it's virtually the only move because if king c2 rook c7 check and queen takes d4 check queen c3 check bishop d4 if rook takes queen takes king g3 this is just the king is uh, exposed and black is winning there quite easily and instead of king c2 um, if we look at king a1 then bishop takes d4 check, then queen takes d4 check there, queen e4 check, queen e1 check, rook f2 check, queen b1, and this is a killing attack as well. So yeah, it's necessary to play bishop b5 check, sorry, bishop b5 here against this queen b6 check. We have queen takes b5, king a1, and now <clears throat> last we're in a winning position. It's his turn to make a mistake. Uh, he plays a mistake here. He's actually technically winning, but he plays rook c7, which is a mistake. The the way to play this, I wonder if you can guess for 200 points, what's the most accurate move here? There's two accurate moves which maintain uh, a win, basically. Can you guess them if I give you 10 seconds to pause the video? Black to play and maintain winning chances against best play. Okay, queen. Okay, rook c7 is the mistake. Either queen c5 or queen c4. So with immediate pressure on d4, that bishop without the back counterpart to just reinforce that. For example, queen g4, rook e7, 
and there's a huge threat using the common squares, the killer common squares, to come in with a vengeance on a2. And white is really pinned down to d4 here. If queen h3, bishop takes d4, and rook e2, and if here, rook b2 check winning the queen, this is just winning for black. So yeah, there's that, or there's queen c5, which has the same effect, basically, uh, the same sort of thing. And also, if here, though, there's also this idea of rook e4, and again, you can see pressure is huge uh, for white. That's another example. So anyway, uh, a mistake was made in in not playing either queen c5 or queen c4. We have actually rook c7. And now we have rook d2. That's a very, very good move, and it's still equal. So it's holding the fort on d4 and holding that second rank. And uh, now <laughs> we have rook c4. Um, and in this position, Harry Nelson Pillsbury played rook hd1. And this is a mistake. Uh, technically, white can hold the drawing chances by playing rook e1, trying for a counter attack with that kind of common square, a drawing common square in this case, not killer one that common square. Uh, so for example, instead of rook d1, let's have a look at rook e1. Uh, queen a5 is <laughs> needed. And if check, check, uh, yeah, white can force a perpetual check, for example, like that. So yes, but he played rook hd1. So this doesn't create those counter checks against black. And now, <laughs> It's it's Emmanuel Lasker's turn to make a mistake. He's in a winning position here technically, uh, but he plays actually rook c3. There's a better move here. This is kind of uncharacteristic of him, and I, I do wonder about the the contextual factors of the game, uh, which um, I'll point out at the end of the video, because uh, there are mistakes from both sides actually. Uh, but I'll give you some pointers. It's it's just a chaotic game. Really, really is chaotic here. So what would be uh, a very, very good move for black to try and secure advantage here, do you think? So not rook c3, that's a clue. If I give you 10 seconds here, what would be the, an accurate move? Okay, queen c6 uh, would be an accurate move, creating a battery, and with a battery you've got common squares like c1, so a big threat of you know c1. If king b1, then bishop g5, and it's again ex accentuating the common c1 square here. This is a really uh, crushing uh, way of playing it. This position, for example, with the check, check, queen takes d4 is a winning position for black. So that would be a really, really crushing way of playing it, queen c6. If we look at, instead of king b1, if we look at king b2, then check and rook takes d4. You can see that common square d4. This seems to be a great deal about common squares, actually, <laughs> this game, uh, and, and pressure, mounting the pressure on those common squares. So anyway, uh, so this opportunity was, was, was missed. Uh, we have actually not uh, creating uh, the battery. Uh, with queen c6, but just this move rook c3. So not this is not the most engine like ac high accuracy game of Lasker by a long shot. We have now queen f5. Uh, now we have queen c4, and <laughs> it's Harry Nelson Pillsbury's turn to make a mistake. Uh, he kind of disconnected his a2 here, a kind of self disconnection tactic. By, by playing king b2 uh, so yeah that is a mistake guess guess what's a lot stronger here than king b2 uh, if white is concerned about c2 and c1 what would you play here which is more accurate if I give you 10 seconds to pause the video Okay, King B1, apparently White's doing well there after King B1. It makes, you know, that connection still exists. Uh, and if Rook takes Rook C1, uh, Black really um, 
hasn't got too much is the exchange down white's got a big advantage there so king b1 was the way to play it but white does this mistake now he, he actually plays king b2 instead and guess what happens now what does emmanuel lasker play here which is a really fantastic move if i give you 10 seconds to pause the video for 200 points Okay, rook takes a3. Yeah, that, again, that that killer common square now a2 is is revealed, uh, or bringing the king out. Uh, white throws in the check first before doing anything. If king a1, then bishop takes d4 check, and if rook takes, then queen takes a2. Um, and if um, king b1, then queen b4 check, and here rook c3 check, and yeah, this is diabolical, isn't it? Basically. Uh, so if queen c2 is the best move, that's not very good. Bishop e3, <laughs> absolutely winning. So yeah, uh, rook takes a3. We have this check, and now king takes. Uh, if queen f5 here, in fact, black can get out of the checks, actually, by going to h8 here. So the checks are not repeating there for white. And if check, uh, where's the next check? Uh, so if king b1, bishop takes d4. And here, this is just going to end in checkmate for white. So... Um, Okay, so king takes a3, the king's been brought out, queen c3 check, and this bishop without the counterpart is pretty lethal here, potentially. b5 check, this is the most accurate way of, accurate way of playing it, to checkmate, imme uh, well, not immediately, but in the fastest way. King takes, the point is queen c4 check, and the game ended here. Uh, if white plays on, if white plays king a5, there's bishop d8, queen b6, bishop takes b6, is checkmate. In terms of accuracy, this is truly horrific for both sides. I have to say, in all honesty, honestly, in all honesty, this is this this is just horrific for both sides. Uh, we have Harry Nelson Pillsbury, uh, one inaccuracy, three mistakes, and two blunders. Yeah, he had remember he had won the Hastings uh, International Tournament not not too long uh, before this game, and. Alaska had two inaccuracies, but also two blunders. Um, his average center ball loss was 29. Uh, yeah, and Harry Nelson Pilsner was actually was 64. So yeah, even though uh, Alaska was um, not that accurate on, on the day of this game, yeah, Harry Nelson Pilsner even worse. Uh, but it was actually, you could argue, it's sort of more difficult for White to play. Uh, I'd like to point out to you, um, there's this fantastic video I've looked at today and yesterday um, with my brother called um, The Life and Chess of Emmanuel Lasker by Lucas Anderson. I want to give a shout out. It gives a context around uh, these tournaments and his track record. It's a two hour video, I'd, you know, maybe split it up into a few parts if you're going to watch it. I, I made a note of where I was at and just watched it, carry on watching uh, the next day. So that's a really recommendable video. But video. I'll put it in the, maybe the pinned comment or the description of this video. Uh, so you get an idea of the context and also I think part of the mistakes there's there's a l implications at chess games com that um, in fact Pillsbury might have been given really bad news about his health on the day of this game which might explain you know huge distractions uh, for Emmanuel Lasker also it seems as though uh, there, there might have been some factors as well which which uh, affected him and I think the arrival of one of his um, friends his future wife um helps his results really gravitate towards in the second half of the tournament he had a remarkable comeback which if, if you check out um the video by uh lucas anderson that, that happened quite a lot in lasker's tournaments that would often um just just ca catch up with a vengeance and win loads of tournaments from from behind he, he was notorious for slow starts to tournaments in fact but this was a particularly bad start for Lasker at the start of this tournament. So they, they're playing each other six times. It was a very good start for Pillsbury. But in the second half, yeah, Pillsbury just collapsed. Uh, so, um, yeah, very fascinating tournament to check out. In, in the end, the scores, Emmanuel Lasker won this tournament with 11.5 out of 18. Steinitz, 9.5 out of 18. Pillsbury, 8 out of 18. And scoring 
uh, 7 out of 18. So, yeah, very, very interesting. Check out this tournament also at chessgames.com as well for some, some context to it. Okay, yeah, very, very interesting. Okay, comments, questions, like, shares, subscribe is all appreciated. And if you want to challenge me for a game, Kings Crusher TV or bit.ly slash chessworld. If you register that, I'll be able to invite you for a game soon after. Okay, thanks very much.